Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to start the, uh, the final talk before lunch. I know that you're all looking forward to, uh, to food, but I hope you're looking forward more to hearing Luke Daly uh, talk about his pet open source project, Jeb, um, which he tells me is a better way to drive WebDriver. <laughs> Um, Luke works for a company called Gradleware, who work on a, uh, a build tool called Gradle. Um, and yeah, this is his project though. This is Jeb. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Simon. Uh, yeah, so here today to talk about Jeb, which, if this wants to work. So let's just jump straight in, because I know I'm between you and lunch, and I wouldn't want to hold that up for you. So what is Jeb? Jeb is a developer-focused DSL, domain-specific language, built on top of WebDriver. When I say developer-focused, it's really geared towards making people who can write reasonable code more productive. It's, it's not a um, GUI tool or anything like that. The, kind of the, the core foundation is that it brings together the power of WebDriver and everything that you get from WebDriver with the elegance and sort of simplicity that jQuery brings to content selection. So uh, who's in the room has used jQuery before? Yeah, OK. So if you've used it, you'll, you'll know that you can get at content in a page very quickly and very elegantly. Uh, the expressiveness of the Groovy programming language. So Jeb is mostly implemented in Groovy. There are some Java, but when you're programming with Jeb, you're writing your code in Groovy. And we'll dig a little bit into Groovy. And it, uh, Jeb brings its own concept of page object modeling, or its own implementation of that. We don't use WebDriver's implementation. And we'll see why that in a second. And it really aims to do a lot of things that I saw a lot of people doing with their own WebDriver code bases. So in their own test stack, they were writing a bunch of utilities to do things like take screenshots at opportune times, and configuration management, and those kind of things. Jeb tries to uh, take care of those responsibilities and just leave you with writing tests. A little bit about the project. It's completely open source, Apache version 2 license. The website is jebbish.org. There is a rather extensive manual, which you can see here, which is kind of the, the documentation for working with Jeb. Uh, Jeb is very dynamic, um, being sort of based on a DSL. So that reference is more useful than the API docs, which are available as well. Uh, source code is available on GitHub. We have the primary support mechanism as a mailing list. And you can get the binary artifacts from Maven Central. And as Simon mentioned, I work for Gradleware. We built, make a build tool called Gradle. So of course, Jeb is built by Gradle. If you'd like to talk about build automation or build tool alternatives, uh, feel free to grab me in the halls or anything like that. So the project is physically made up of a core module, which provides 90% of the things you'll play with, and then different test adapters for different testing frameworks. So we have support for Spock, which is a Groovy-based testing framework, which is very popular in the Groovy world. It's kind of like a JUnit++. For well, JUnit 3, 4, TestNG, EasyB is kind of like a groovy cucumber kind of thing. And we work with cucumber as well. So the core by itself doesn't know anything about testing. It's really just page objects and um, the core abstractions. And then we can adapt into testing frameworks. It's a little about Groovy. Groovy is a dynamic JVM language. It's compiled, never interpreted, ever. Uh, it is dynamic and is optionally typed, so you can use the type system if you like, uh, but you're not forced to. A nice thing about it is that it's 99.999, however many nines you want to put on there, Java syntax compatible. You can take Java source code, change the extension to .groovy, and it will almost always compile. And from there, you can start to trim away some Java syntax and get to a more concise representation. This Groovy has some nicer constructs, that kind of thing. Has a lot of language features that make it great for DSLs. It's very dynamic in a lot of ways, uh, more so than languages like Ruby and Python. And it's really a low cost uh, switch from Java. If you're comfortable with Java, you can get up and running with Groovy very quickly. It's exactly the same class model. There is no bridging cost between the core Java APIs. It, it's really just um, a lighter weight, more flexible Java in a lot of ways. And they work great together. So the type system, as I said, it, it is dynamic. So here we have this def, which you might have seen from other languages, is really just a synonym for object. So v is just a variable, an untyped variable. Here we are assigning a string to it. We can call a string method. You notice we don't have to do any casting at all. Uh, and later on, we're going to assign an integer to it, call an integer method. That. So 
the type, it, all of those methods are actually being resolved at runtime. And as I said, typing is optional, so I have an integer variable here that I have specified the type of. I'm trying to assign a string to it. That's going to give me a runtime error, not a compile time error. It's very dynamic in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that we use in Jeb quite a lot is the ability to respond to method calls dynamically. So here I have this upcaser class that implements this special method missing, which is a symbolic method in Groovy. And whenever I call an object on this class that it doesn't, sorry, I call a method on this object that it doesn't know about, it's going to end up coming into here. So if you've, if you've done some Ruby, this will look very familiar. If you're just more used to static languages, this might be a bit foreign. But it allows you to reinterpret what a method call actually means and do some interesting stuff. The other thing that is really nice about Groovy is it has closures. There's like function pointers or Ruby blocks. So little bits of code variables that I can reuse and call in different ways. So here I've got a, a doubler closure that simply takes uh, its implicit argument. It just means the, the single implicit argument and doubles it. Uh, we use this in Jeb for specifying things like the conditions that we're waiting for. So I have a block. I'm waiting for this condition to get returned true. Model that as a closure, and Jeb can take that and continuously retry it for you. So you don't have to use anonymous inner classes or all that kind of chunky Java syntax. This is nice and light, effectively doing the same thing. And it's very nice for DSL. So having a specific block of code that has a specific meaning. So here, this is an example of the Jeb content DSL, which we'll dig into later. But it, inside that block, everything has kind of a different meaning to what it would normally. The other Groovy feature that we use is the ability to rewrite code at compile time. So it, to aid debugging, when we're using waiting statements and we have an expression in there, we will implicitly at compile time turn that into an assertion. And one nice thing about Groovy is that, so this is the source code that you write. After compile, it's kind of like this. It's not exactly like this, but this is the net effect. And assertions in Groovy have what's called power assert output. So each uh, constituent component of the expression is part of the exception message and its value, which is really nice. You don't have to write uh, human-readable strings for your waiting clauses. You can extrapolate that from the actual source code. So all of this really just leads to clarity. This is a, a fully functional example of performing a search via the Google homepage. Uh, we've got some classes hidden, but this is what a Jeb script looks like. So we have this drive method inside here. We're using the Jeb domain-specific language to do a bunch of things. So you can see that that's, that's quite high level. Right, so that, that's, that's Groovy and what we do with Groovy. Now I'll dig into some of the Jeb-specific features. So at the heart of it, we have the, what was called the Navigator API, which is basically the jQuery ripoff. So we have this dollar method, which is kind of available everywhere. And the general format is that you can pass it a CSS selector, an index or a range, and some attribute or text matches. So the first example here, we're saying, OK, give me all the divs. It's like jQuery that the return object is a collection. So here we've got all the divs. The second example is saying, oh, I want the first div. The third one saying, I want the first three divs, because I'm using a groovy range construct. And I can combine these things together. So here I'm saying, I want the third h2 element where the ID is section and its text is Jeb. So quite a concise representation of a selector. And it's all built on top of web element. So that's what's happening underneath the hoods, but you, you, in Jeb you rarely deal with a web element. We have this navigator construct on top. So CSS selectors, we support all the CSS selectors that WebDriver supports, obviously, which ends up being what the browser supports. And that's the preferable mechanism to use whenever you can, because it's very fast. Attribute and text matching, so um, there's a little bit of special groovy syntax in here that don't necessarily need to worry about for now, but we have a div with an attribute of foo. The value is bar. We can use this contract, contract to pull that guy out. Text is kind of a special attribute, which allows us to get at the, the node text. And we can use regular expressions in here. This is the groovy uh, um, regular expression syntax. Jeb also ships with a bunch of nice predicates for doing partial matches. So I'm saying I want the, all the paragraphs that start with the letter P. The second example, I'm saying all of the paragraphs whose class attribute contains case insensitively section. And I can also use regular expressions with these guys too. So here I'm saying give me all the paragraphs whose ID ends with a number. 
in the, in the third one. And there are more of those. They're all case insensitive and they all take regular expressions as well optionally. Which is, this can be really nice for dealing with markup you don't have control over that's quite badly formatted. You don't have nice IDs, you have to do some funky stuff to get it exactly what you want. And you can express it quite concisely. A nice characteristic of these navigator objects that return by the dollar function is that you can then find relative content based on them quite easily. Again, stealing from the idea of jQuery. So I can get back an object and find content around it relative to it. And I just what you'd expect, filter all the stuff around it based on CSS selectors and attribute matches and all that other stuff. And some other things that the navigator provides, ways to click content, ways to get at the node text, ways to set the value of the control uh, in a control agnostic way. So whether this is a select or a text area or an import or things like that, we abstract that away. So this value method here. And you can, of course, access the web element objects if you need to get to them at the underneath layer. So that was the Navigator API. There's, there's a bit more to it, but in the, in the time I have, that's kind of all I want to go through there. It's, it really is designed to be uh, close to the jQuery API and function in the same kind of way. It's not identical because we have a different programming language which gives us some different options, but that, that's the general concept. And it's available everywhere. It's, it's the mechanism for selecting content out of the page. So now shifting up to the browser object. So the browser object in Jeb is really the encapsulation of a specific WebDriver instance and a current page. I'll provide some more things, but that's, that's the general idea. So I new up one of these Jeb browser objects. I give it a driver. Anything that you, you know, want to use, this is just, the, there's no sort of trick to this. It's just a normal WebDriver. From there, I can actually access the underlying WebDriver should I need to. Most of the time you don't because we provide an abstraction over the top of it. For example, this go method, which is just equivalent to calling the, um, the same, I think it's go on the driver. Yeah. And the other kind of unique thing is that it, it wraps up this concept of a current page as well. So the browser object is always tracking a page instance of what the current page is. What the browser object does, using Groovy's dynamism, when you call a method on the browser object that it can't interpret, it will just forward it onto the current page object. So you don't have to do page.method or page.this, that kind of thing. You can just start talking directly to the browser. So you're just removing or hiding one level of indirection. Then we take that further, and then in the test adapters, we actually dynamically forward to the browser object as well. So you don't have to be calling driver.this, driver.that, or browser.this or that. You can just be talking at these high-level methods that are either browser methods or methods and content on the current page. So you don't have to track those variables. What it leads to is tests that look like specifications or closer to specifications. It's almost getting to the realms of, of natural language without having to you know, put things in there like variable definitions or those kind of things which just obscure the meaning of the test. So a little bit about the page object model. Uh, as I said before, it's completely different to WebDriver's notion of page objects. We have our own system for doing this. Uh, and it's, it's based on using DSLs instead of annotations. Annotations are great. They're just uh, quite static. So for, and you, you, I'm sure you would have found this, when you need to sort of construct something dynamically, you have to write your own code to do that. And that's fine, but the, our approach being based on that, it's kind of geared towards doing that. We'll see that. So here I have a page object which is representing the Google homepage. There's three kind of main characteristics or attributes of a page. I can define what is its URL. So when I say go to this page, where am I going? And that can be an absolute or relative URL. And I can control the uh, base that it's resolved against in different ways. I have an at check. We'll see a bit more on this later, but I want to say, am I at this page right now? Am I at the Google homepage? Well, how do I specify that? So here we have a static at property, we have a closure, and that will just run, and that will return true or false, whether we're at the page or not. Um, we'll dig into that a little bit more later. And the, the, the meat of it is this content DSL here, the static content attribute, which is a closure. And inside there is a, um, the, what we would call the content DSL. Content DSL is about naming templates or factories for content. It's not about grabbing a specific piece of content and giving it a name. 
it's a bit more uh, interesting than that. So let's just walk through this example. We're on the Google results page. And unless they've changed it again this week, it just should still work. So I have at the very base of my sort of content stack here, I'm saying, what is the what, what result content? Well, it turns out to be every single LI element with the class G. So I've pulled that content out, and I essentially have a collection of all these list items that are the results. I then have this other content factory that's parameterized. I can say, give me the specific result. So, and it uses other content, stacks on top of it, to build on that definition. I then go further and say, well, I want the actual link element inside the list. And again, I can re build on top of these previous elements dynamically. And at the end, I say, well, I kind of, I want, I'm interested in the first result a lot of the time, so I'm going to model that explicitly and just stack on top of this. So what we end up doing is, by splitting the definition of the content out into these different pieces, making the definition quite robust. If one bit changes, I can just change that a little bit, and everything else comes along for the ride. So once I have those templates defined, down here I can say, well, in this particular case, I'm after the third result link. And I can just reuse those templates to pull that out. And you can templatize these in any fashion you want. They're like little method calls. You can have two or three arguments coming in, deploying things out. So um, You don't really see it very well in this example, but that can be a real time saver and also really shrink the size of your page objects, being able to define content in this dynamic way. A nice feature about the content DSL is that by default, all of the content is treated as required. So here, in this example, I have I've defined three pieces of content. Paragraph A pulls out p.a, p.b, and p.c, as you'll see. If we walk through how this actually works, when I ask for paragraph A, .text, you know, given the HTML at the top, that's there on the page, that's fine, it's just going to return that object for us. When I ask for paragraph B, there is no paragraph B. So Jeb will fail fast with this required page content, not, not present exception, and will show you the path, the named path of the content you're trying to access. So you will see the symbolic names in the content tree of what you're trying to get to, and also a representation uh, of the HTML as well. And sometimes things are optional. They might be on the page, they might not be. So you can specify an option in the content DSL to say, this guy isn't really required. It's OK to return back null content. Uh, one of the sort of themes in Jeb is to try and fail fast uh, and try and make it easy for you to do that, because it just makes debugging easier. Another feature of the content DSL is it allows you to embed the actual physical structure of your application as part of the content. So here I'm specifying that the help link, this is what it is on the page, but there's an option saying that when this guy is clicked, it takes us to the help page. So I have some code down here. I'm saying I'm at the front page. Who defines this guy? I want to click the help link. And Jeb will use this information to, underneath the hood, change out the page object to help page who defines heading. So if you think about it, um, the actual the attribute of where you're going to in your application when you interact with content is a characteristic of the page or the content. It doesn't belong in the test. We also uh, have support for asynchronous content in the DSL. So I can say that this error message uh, is dynamic. It may not be there when I first ask for it, but Jeb will wait for it for you. Uh, very similar to implicit weights in WebDriver. It's very tunable, though. Uh, for any particular element, I can say, yes, this is asynchronous. This, uh, it's OK to wait for this. Others, it's not. I can say, in this particular case, I want to wait for 30 seconds for this guy, because he's really slow. And I can also use these named parameters, which are controllable by configuration. So I can say, well, this guy's slow, and on this environment, that's going to be 300 seconds I'm going to wait. So waiting works very much like it does in WebDriver, where we just sort of continuously poll for an, uh, um, a condition to become true. And this is also nice, too, because if you think about it similarly to uh, application structure, whether or not something is asynchronous in terms of it's there or it's not, usually doesn't belong in the test. It's usually not really useful to a user. They do something, and as far as they're concerned, it's kind of there straight away. But really, in terms of implementation, it's not. So you can bury that detail 
in the content DSL very concisely. The other uh, nice thing about the content DSL is you don't have to model just navigator objects or you know, elements on the page. We can define, we can name strings, numbers, domain objects, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be content. And weighting works in a similar way. So modules, so that was page objects. There's a little bit more to them, but they're the high level features. Modules are reusable components that you can embed in pages. So we see this all the time, a common widget that's reused across a bunch of pages. Now inheritance, page object inheritance has been the typical model people use to do this, which is, becomes a problem very quickly. So modules are a composition mechanism. So here I have a module which models Google search. So I have, I'm defining what is the field, the input field that people type in, and the button that people click to say, yes, please go and find my content. And whenever it's clicked, it goes to the Google results page. Another uh, thing about modules and pages is that you can define methods and properties and all these kinds of you know, traditional things on them. They're just objects with, this, with these special static attributes. So I can have behavior defined in these pages as well. So it turns out that both the Google home page and the Google results page can do searches. And they're actually implemented the same way, largely, from a HTML point of view. So in this case, I've got the home page model and the results page, and I can just include the module via this special module keyword, and then my page is composed of that guy as well. Then this is what it looks like when I'm actually using one of those pages. That four-term method is this guy here. So that's really nice for uh, reusable widgets that are spread across your application in different spots. Modules are also great for modeling repeating content. So here I have a table, simple uh, two columns, two rows. What I, want, I want to model this guy in a way that I can get at any particular cell very easily. So I, it turns out I can model a row as a module. And a characteristic of a module is that content lookups inside a module are scoped. So I have this content template here where I can get the book results and I want to give it a row number. So I want to access a row on the table. I can use this module keyword and say my module is of type book row and this is the base. This is the scope of all content lookups inside the module. So here I'm finding the particular row with the index that was passed in. And down here, you'll notice that when I'm pulling out a, the particular um, cell, I don't have to scope it to the particular table that I'm using up here because all the content lookups are already scoped for me. So this makes modules very reusable. I end up with code like this. So give me the first row, who is the title? What is the title? Do a history. In the second row, the author is Peter Hamilton. So again, you can define repeating structures or complex structures very, very concisely, very powerfully by using this dynamism. So just a quick word on Spock. I mentioned it when I was going through the test adapters. Spock is a very popular testing framework in the, in the Groovy space. It's completely JUnit compatible. It goes everywhere JUnit does, CI servers, IDEs, all that fun stuff. And this is what it looks like. So it has the same class and method based structure, but it has some interesting innovations. Uh, one that you'll see straight away is that you can have um, rather descriptive method names, which is nice. You don't have to de case everything. Uh, and it also has this semantic structure in these given when and then blocks, which allow you to quite easily, and without having to add rather redundant comments, split uh, your tests up into precondition actions and expectations. And another nice uh, attribute of the Spock test is that every single statement in a then block is an implicit assertion. So you don't have to clutter your test with um, any kind of assertion libraries like Hamcrest or anything like that. You can just use normal expressions and Spock will turn that into an assertion for you. So the whole, whole point is just it's one level closer to sort of your plain text cucumber style reports. And if you're interested more in Spock, uh, spockframework.org. I usually recommend to people if they're looking at Jeb and looking at you know, some new ways, definitely take a look at Spock. It goes great with Jeb. So in the time we have left, I'd just like to sort of breeze through a couple of the high level features that Jeb provides. So one of, the, one of the first things it does is it takes care of grabbing screenshots and 
HTML reports for you. And it, it determines the location based on the class name and the method name. So you can just turn this on and specify when to take screenshots, either at the end of every test method or only when there's a test failure, and it will do it for you. Again, something you can do with the WebDriver API yourself. It's just nice to have something to take care of this for you. And you can, at any particular time, use this report method to grab a screenshot of what's happening right now. It can be useful for debugging. We also do some driver management to try and, uh, as, as an optimization. So we take care of caching the driver instance and sharing it across test cases for you per thread. So you don't have to, so just to avoid spinning up a new browser instance per every single test. And we take care of clearing cookie state and that kind of thing. And it's highly configurable how this caching works. But the net result is that you can just drop it in and your test will be faster unless you're doing this kind of thing yourself already. And it's fairly tunable as well. There is a configuration management mechanism. So we look for a script or a class on the class path via a conventional name and use it to configure the JEB runtime. So this is a nice way to deal with cross-browser testing and configuring different browsers. So in this section, uh, I'm outside of the environments block. These are my defaults. So the default driver I want to run with is Firefox driver. And here I can configure it and set parameters on it before it's returned to be used by the actual tests. Here's where I can configure uh, how waiting works in this particular environment. So by default, if I don't specify that uh, waiting should spe uh, wait for a certain number of seconds, uh, I'm going to use this default to two. And we saw before that I said that we can use named presets in waiting, to specify the waiting parameters. And here's how they can be defined. So anything that we're going to say wait slow is going to take, we're going to wait for 100 seconds. You can also do things in here like configure where Jeb will put its screenshots and HTML dumps and all those kind of things. And it is environment aware. So I can specify in this environments block multiple named environments and then tune the configuration. So this is typically how I recommend people uh, configure uh, the different drivers and those kind of things. It's also useful for uh, implementing the eternal optimist pattern for waiting. So for your local developer workstation, you can specify that my default waiting is going to be 30 seconds. But on the CI server, you can say, well, I'd rather have more robust tests than get hit errors early, so I'm going to wait for five minutes by default just to make sure I don't get you know, um, false negatives. And you control the environment via this JVM system property called jeb.env. So however you're running your test, you just specify that somehow, and we'll pick that up and select the right environment to run with. Uh, at checking, so I breezed past this before, so it, it's really, really quite simple. You specify this at closure, static at closure as part of your page, and then whenever you ask the browser to check where I'm at, we'll use that to actually find out, yes, am I here or not? Does this condition return true? Now, if this fails, this is one of the statements that we write, we write at compile time into an assertion. So if this fails, I'll actually get diagnostic information about exactly what this was. So I don't have to write any extra text to kind of, or any kind of um, plain English sentences to help me out there. I can just see what were all the values in the expression quite nicely. And that they can be as sophisticated as you like. You can do as many checks in there as you want to. Each individual statement becomes a separate assertion. The, other, the, not, the nice thing about uh, at checking is that if you have a content lookup failing because you're at the wrong page, that can be kind of tricky to work out just by looking at the content lookup failing. Whereas this tells you very quickly that I'm at the wrong page. Something happened. I got to a different thing than I was, what I was expecting. Much easier to diagnose and debug. We also have constructs for uh, ad hoc waiting. So this is uh, similar to the wait class in WebDriver. So because we have closures, we can just be a bit more concise about it. So I can say, here I want to wait for that particular content to appear on the page in the first line. And then it's returned out of the closure, and I can call a method on it and does it equal error. What's also nice is because Groovy has a, quite a flexible definition of the truth, which, which is nice. Um, any non-empty string is true. Any non-empty collection, so, so, so as long as the wait for closure returns something that is true-ish, then it is considered to have succeeded. So you can kind of wrap more uh, complex conditions and expressions inside the wait blocks and then still use the result. That's a little bit trickier using an anonymous inner classes. And it's, it's very configurable. So just like we saw in the DSL, I can specify how long I want to wait for, 
how quickly do I want to retry the expression, and I can use those named presets. Uh, we've already spoken about implicit power assertions. I'll skip past that in the interest of time. And they are used everywhere, so everywhere waiting is used in these at checks. Um, they're really nice. They save you, save you a lot of time debugging. You kind of don't really get an appreciation for that until you start to see them and you get to be able to find out what went wrong very quickly. Also have API for directly downloading from within inside the JVM. So in this case, we're getting to an application. We, we can't access the PDF until we've logged in. And I want to get the PDF and examine the bytes and make sure it, in, it, it contains some content. So we can use Jeb to log in, perform the login process. We've gotten inside the application. We have our session cookie. Now we want to get the raw bytes of the PDF. What do we do? Well, what Jeb does for you is it takes care of copying the cookies from the, the browser, constructs a java.url connect, connection, and gives you access to that content. So again, it's something you can do yourself, but it's just nice and convenient. And I can get it as an input stream, or I can get it as text. We also provide an abstracted DSL over WebDriver's action support, which is just a little bit nicer. So using our types of uh, the navigator and kind of implicitly behind the scenes binding all these method calls to the driver. So just taking some noise out of that and getting a little bit closer to what it looks like, or what a, how a user thinks about it. And it's just built on, directly on top of WebDriver's action support. I'm not doing anything special there. So provide a nice syntax shortcut for dealing with controls. You can, so if I, I'm, here I'm setting the first name property. And first name is not something that's defined by the browser object or the current page object. We'll then fall back to looking for the first input or control on the page with that name. So I don't have to, if all I want to do is set this guy's value and pull it out, I don't have to explicitly go and name and define the content of my page object. I can just refer to it by its name. And we'll find that and set it. And in a control agnostic way. If this is a select, we'll go through all the options and find the select that matches that value and make sure it's set. If it's a multi-select, I can assign an array, that kind of thing. So it all just kind of works. And the same for reading. Here's your browser.firstName. We'll find the first control. We have uh, some syntactic sugar for dealing with JavaScript. So given here, I've got a global JavaScript variable and a global function. I can actually call these guys like they're inside the JVM. So to browser.js gives me this JavaScript proxy. I can ask for a variable. We'll translate that into a JavaScript call using WebDriver's JavaScript bridge and get that value out. Can be nice for when you've got no other way of testing whether something happened than setting some global flag in your JavaScript. Uh, not to be abused, of course. And the same for functions. We can call uh, global JavaScript functions in the same way. So just to be clear, this is groovy code down here, not JavaScript. We also provide a jQuery adapter or proxy. So I can select content with Jeb using the Navigator API, then get a jQuery proxy for that content, and then call jQuery methods on that proxy and we'll forward them to jQuery underneath. Again, this is really just for cases where you need to simulate some kind of event or test some interaction that's not very easy or reliable to do with WebDriver. Now, some things this is just the path of least resistance for. And again, it's, some, it's there if you need it, but you shouldn't base your tester on this stuff, of course. Use the WebDriver stuff whenever you can. We also have some nice syntax for dealing with frames and windows. So in the first case, I'm selecting a particular frame on the page. So it's the footer. So the, the frame element has the idea footer. I can grab that guy out. Inside the closure, all my content lookups are going to happen inside that frame. At the end of the closure, focus switches back to the main window. Typically, that's what you want to do. Jump to a frame, do some stuff, come back to the main one. Similarly, for windows, we have two uh, ways of doing this. So I can say with window to select the window for a certain amount of time. Inside here, we run this closure. It's exactly the same kind of code that you would have in an at check against each window. And the first one to return true for this, that's what we'll focus on for the um, duration of the closure. And if you know you're going to be opening a new window, you can wrap it in this with new window construct, put the actual code that's going to force the new window to open inside there, and we'll focus to it, and we'll actually close it at the end of this. So just to wrap up, Jeb is really just a groovy layer on top of WebDriver. It does everything that WebDriver does, and nothing it really doesn't do, just kind of provides some convenience and brings some stuff together to try and make life easier. The, the elegance and power that jQuery brings to it really makes content selection and defining content and dealing with badly marked up content easy and nice. 
The page object model, because we take uh, advantage of Groovy's dynamism, allows you to do some interesting things and keep things very concise. And we try and provide some of these on-the-fringe uh, features, like downloading robots with session state and that kind of thing. So why would you use Jeb? Well, one of the main reasons that I find is, is test clarity, if this is important to you, that you want to have high-level specifications but don't necessarily want to go the uh, route of natural language processing with Cucumber and Gherkin and those kind of things. This can be something good to look at. Uh, it, it typically does a lot of things that, like, as I said before, people tend to do themselves with WebDriver. So you can just offload that responsibility and get somebody else to do it. It's really optimized for people who can write code. Um, that's its target audience, so people who are using programming against the raw Java WebDriver API right now. And the, the, the power and efficiency that you get with DSLs. And at the end of the day, you can write less support code for your test and write more and better tests. So thank you very much. If you'd like more information, you can go to jebbish.org. And uh, I think we're at time. But if anybody has any questions? Yes? OK. Uh, how does uh, Jeb interact with uh, Mumbai JVM or uh, any other BTT tools on top of uh, Spock? Like other than to Spock, you mentioned, how does it interact with Cucumber or Cucumber JVM? OK, um, it's really, it's quite light, basically. Uh, it's just usually providing some kind of mechanism so that all method calls and property accesses are just forwarded to a browser that's managed underneath. Um, so the adapter for JUnit and Spock is uh, tiny classes with a tiny amount of code. So you can, anywhere that those other test tools run, you can put this stuff in. It doesn't. Jeb doesn't have its own execution model at all. It piggybacks on something like JUnit or Cucumber to manage the execution of tests and test reports and that kind of thing. Uh, so does it have any parser for Gherkin or other domain specific language like Gherkin or something like that? Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Uh, is, does this have any parser for uh, other domain specific languages like Gherkin? No, it, no, it, it doesn't. So what, what people are doing with Cucumber is, is still having their uh, Gherkin step definitions, but the actual code that backs the step definition is just written in this stuff. Okay. So they still, they're driving it with the front end via Gherkin and then implementing those steps with this. It's just a, 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 being able to take some of the, um, take advantage of the things like closures and that kind of stuff. So. Yes? Uh, that Hello? Hello. Thank you. Some thanks. Um, so Groovy is similar to Ruby because it's dynamic, but the difference is that it's compiled, right? One of the differences, yeah. Yeah, one very, of the very similar. Groovy really came about by seeing uh, how good Ruby was at some things and wanting sure. a more Java compatible version. Yeah. So my question is, we use Ruby, and the issue we face when we define a DSL, for example, in page models, you define your content elements on the fly, right? So uh, the issue which we face is how you use autocomplete in your ID and how you can jump to source. Do you have the same issue with Groovy? Uh, with Groovy by itself, not so much because it has a strong type system. So Groovy is a strongly typed language, but it's optionally typed. With Jeb, the runtime is very dynamic. So IDEs have a hard time with this stuff. Uh, that is something we're looking at, but yeah, it is a problem. If you really, really like autocomplete and can't live without it, this might not be the thing for you. Okay, guys. Um, I think if you've got any more questions, Luke is going to be here for you know the rest of the conference. Um, grab him over lunch. I'm sure you can have great conversations about Groovy. Um, but thank you very much, Luke. I have Jason kicking off here at 2 o'clock with his uh, talk on robots with an actual live robot demo.